Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sync B-Sides. It's been a while since we had our last episode because A, I've been busy and B, no one wanted to come on our show. So we've got a really exciting one today. Uh, I've got Cassandra Ong from Otter Half. So uh, full disclosure, Otter Half was, uh, was a client of ours, is no longer a client of ours as of literally like a couple of days, so it's fine. And Cass has been in the marketing game for a very long time. I, I won't go too much into accolades, but she's worked as the head of growth, as a head of marketing at companies like Trope and, and many other big ones, Food Panda as well. And she is an extremely experienced marketer who started her own growth agency focused on, is it safe to say startups? Are we looking at, you know, uh, fast tech, growth companies? Tech, tech. Uh, should we say so? Uh, tech companies, so we're not even going to pretend that they're startups, tech companies uh, <laughs> and looking to scale across, uh, I would say, the world. Anyway, Cass, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for having me on this. Uh, very excited to be sharing some of the very, maybe, you know, not so easy questions uh, that thing will be asking me today. Uh, but let's see. Let's see how that goes. But yeah, I think according to what Ting said, so I, I am the founder of AutoHub, a marketing agency, uh, a very early stage marketing agency um, that specializes in growing tech companies. Why I say early stage is because uh, we've only been around for like three months. Uh, I started in April, but very also very thankful that, you know, um, as of today, uh, we already have three clients on board and, uh, and counting. So yeah, uh, I mean, I, I mean, also maybe giving you guys a little bit of uh, understanding about what Author Half, why the name came about, because, you know, Author and Half. Basically, it is um, a pun on other half. We want to be that, you know, partner, the marketing partner or business partner that, you know, tech businesses turn to uh, for support. Uh, and why authors? Because, you know, authors are always uh, seen to be very friendly. They are very cute. Um, and I, I guess, uh, I mean, because how, how AutoHub came about is also um, the, the team, the founding team were being let go in our previous company. And we came together and started out this company. And, um, and a characteristic of authors are they tend to hunt in packs. So, you know, we really came together and I think this is a, also a reflection of how authors behave. So, yeah, that's the reason how, you know, author how came about. Awesome. Okay, that, that was a lot better introduction than I gave you, Cass, and I apologize. You made me look bad on my own, uh, on the own podcast that we're doing. <laughs> no, no, no worries, no worries. No, that was cool. That was really good. I'm, I'm glad you gave us a little bit of context as well because I, I was going to go into it a little bit later, but it's really good. I think we got it out of the start, yeah? Uh, I mean, the fact that you said that you've only been in business for three months is really interesting because um, what I really want to know is, because I already have my thoughts on this because I, I still remember when I started my agency, but what was the biggest misconception you had about starting an agency actually? I Okay, so, I mean, I have an experience in marketing, of course, thanks for the great introduction uh, for more than 12 years, but I never ever worked in an agency before. I mean, um, so I've always been a on the client side. So, of course, diving into the unknown and, you know, plucking, out, pl plucking that courage, you know, to, to just start something out on my own, I thought it would be extremely difficult. But I guess after, you know, talking to people, and I guess, you know, when you, we see the problem as an as a enti entirety, we'll think that, well, it's a big problem, you know, it's a lot to cover. But then when we break it down to small different parts, like, you know, we, and then, you know, taking baby steps, I realized that, as I talk to you know founders or even marketers, right? Uh, we have a we have covered our niche in tech marketing, which is not a, a lot of uh, agencies for today. Today, and I guess uh, the miscon so the mi biggest misconception for me is it will be extremely difficult. As I grew, as I as I you know start getting my clients, I realized if it is broken down into small bits, your problem becomes smaller, and you know you are able to overcome that. So I think that is one. Uh, I think the other bit about uh, the mis I mean, I also have another misconception, right? Because I, I thought that, you know, coming from, because, you know, I had never had experience in, in agency. So I thought that I could break away from mm -hmm. the usual structure of an agency. Uh, because, you know, how agencies are, right? You know, they have your account servicing, mm -hmm. you know, they have your creative director. I and, I want, and I wanted to uh, mirror that, mir mirror my agency to that of a, of a startup. Like, you know, you know, how a tech startup is like, you know, my head of partnerships, head of social media, head of SEO, right? But I realized very quickly after my first, of course, first two 
uh, clients that there is a need for client servicing. <laughs> and, and, and I guess now I settle for a hybrid. Lah. Uh, I mean, I of course still mirror. I mean, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, but Cass, you know, you haven't, you haven't really done agency work. How do you know how it works? So I said, I think that can be an advantage and it can, that can also be a, a disadvantage, right? But I see it, see it as an advantage I, and I can be creative about how I structure my team. And I, I guess now I think bits of what work in agency because, you know, they always say don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> and, and I settled for a hybrid. So, so yeah, I thought it would, yeah, so I, I hope I answered your question thing. Yeah. No, no, that was a really interesting answer because I think a lot of people always talk when you when you, when we say misconception, right? And I've asked this question to many people of uh, private conversations, interviews and stuff, and everyone has a very similar kind of cookie cutter answer, which is like, you know, I didn't realize how much work was involved and stuff like that. But when you really get to the nuts and bolts of it, running a business is a lot like I don't know, I don't even know a really good analogy for it because every business is a little different and every time the person who starts a business, especially the founding team or like your first team your skill sets are different, right? So there are people who be really good at certain things, people that are really, or maybe they're really specialized at what they do, but they're really terrible at everything else. Like organizational stuff, team management, client management, they're terrible. And it's not their fault. They were never, it was never their goal to be, you know, that type of thing. But you need everybody to be yeah. kind of like all around it, especially at the start, because you're like, oh, I don't actually physically do not have time to do this. Can someone step in yes. and no one does, right? So. The, the misconception I had, at least from my side, was that people, I, I assume that clients for the most part value outcome over, you know, everything else. If you can get them good results, that's all they cared about. What I found out the very hard way is they care about a lot of things, outcome being a really important part of it, but there's also a ton of really important parts of it that have nothing to do with outcome and all about basically making them feel good. And so... Like, like you said, like I pushed into having client management, some sort of, some form of client management as well. Very early on after I realized that I was the one making the mistake. I mean, okay, so like, like tagging onto that, right? Because now that you said you've never been in agencies, now that you're on the other side of the fence, right? What was the, what's the kind of the biggest change to the way that you actually do your work? Because I mean, I've, I've been both, I've been in-house and I've been in agency, I've been both sides. There's a massive gulf. I'll, I'll just give you kind of lay the premise for you. When I was working in-house at most companies, I wouldn't say all, but most companies I worked in-house, I was working, I was very efficient, but at the same time, extremely inefficient with the things that I was doing. Because I was doing a lot of things that weren't really, I would say, necessary. It was just company structure kind of forced you to do that. And then I so I felt like, okay, cool. I've actually done all the important work. It's 11 a.m. I've got nothing else to do, but I've just got to sit in for like seven meetings now in a row that I've got nothing to do with. And that's how I felt. And so, which is why I, I kind of went back to agency later on because I was like, I feel I, and this is going to sound horrible and I hope people take it wrongly, but I felt like I was getting dumber because I was, I was not challenged in any way at all. And that's not, that's not to knock on because I've seen in-house agencies, in-house teams do amazing stuff, but the, when you go to a slightly established company or you go to a company that has a very set structure, yeah, you're not, you're not really, you're not breaking, you're not breaking the mold. You to break the mold. You have to, I don't know, you have to like change everything from top down in the marketing's in the middle somewhere. So uh, yeah, sorry, long, long winded way of asking. What was like, how, how did you change? The Think firstly, you, you have to give yourself more credit for being efficient, you know, <laughs> like 11 a.m. and you're finished your work, well, that's efficiency, okay? <laughs> that was really like I, I used to do like 10 times like not even an exaggerate 10 times yeah. the amount of working agents so I was I can very feel surprised. you know because I also experienced somewhat similar when I was in a big organization like TripAdvisor um, and and I think I think the effect of it was also you know COVID right and I was there during COVID as well um, and yeah. of course a lot of work was uh, pivoted uh, to to uh, market to domestic travelers instead of international travelers. And then, you know, there's only a limit. There's no budget, right? So there's only a limit to, to the kind of marketing you can do, which is usually your usual email, email marketing, <laughs> right? Because these are generally very cost-efficient ways. But anyway, okay, so I can be late. I can yeah. be late. But um, I guess what has been the biggest change to the way I work, uh, and I think I'm just going to 
I mean, I'm just, just going to put uh, in, in context, uh, I'm going to relate my work to the, the work that I did in startups, basically, you know, uh, Food Panda or Anchope. So what I realized, I've having been, you know, in this uh, for three, four months already, is that in, in-house, you actually do a lot of execution work. Like you've got no time, you really got no time to think for the business, the strategize for the business. I mean, you do, but very, very pockets of time, right? Because you are put into all sorts of meetings, right? Like, <laughs> and then you just need to solve problems, yeah. right? <laughs> you do a lot of yeah, execution yeah, yeah. work. And I can say for really, food financial, really, I di- really spend 98% of my time. I get 99, 98% of my time doing execution. Uh, and also very interestingly, uh, recently, when I was pitching to a fintech as well as a uh, ed, ed, edutech company, potential, two potential clients, then they asked me because you know I I pitch my ideas and and then they say, okay, Cass, you know what? Uh, what's the difference between hiring you and and getting my people to do? Like, what's the difference? And I told them, I was in your shoes before. I was a head of marketing of Trope and 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 Food Panda, and of course growth in uh, senior growth uh, market manager in Trope Advisor. I realized that when I was in a startup or an early stage slash growth stage, like, as long as there's pressure to grow, I spend a lot of my time executing yeah. and I don't think. And, and it's tough, right? You, I mean, if you want to do thinking work like strategizing, it's, it, you can, but it's going to be out of your... By the time I finish my work, it's right, 10 p.m., 11 p.m., and then you still have to go and think about things. So, so I, I guess in an agency, on the reverse, on the contrary, I actually really do a lot of strategy work. Uh, I think for my clients, I get access to their data, of course, sign NDA, uh, I get access to their data and, and I try to see, you know, which are the, some of the things that they can optimize, uh, which function that they can do better or very good ROI and which are the place, which are the areas that they can double down on. And it's very exciting for me because I see like, wow, actually this company is doing really well and but how can they be better? What kind of effect they can, they can provide to to uh to I mean for that that that's in in line with their direction or business goals right, so I think that's one biggest change. Uh, in fact, previously last time I only set aside maybe one day, half a day to a day to do focus work, but now in an agency I actually set aside two days to do focus work, <laughs> and the rest of the days are really um you know stakeholder slash project management uh kind of work like, because you have clients. Yeah. So. So yeah, I think that's that's the biggest biggest change I realized. No, that that, that definitely makes sense because I think what you're doing now is utilization of your time, right? It's different when you're in agency, when you're in when you're in house. It's kind of how you utilize your time in the best way. I, I can I can relate. I can relate. I think I think for me it was a little different given the fact that um, when we when I first started, I had a team of uh, one person. And one person is me. <laughs> okay. And I had it. Then I had an intern, then I had an intern, and that guy was, he's a really good guy. Like, he, I actually, very fond of him. He, he hates everybody. I'm very fond of him, but, like, he was like, this is this is what I can do, and I don't want to talk to people. I'm like, all right, that, I, can't, I can't use you for a lot of things, but he was very good at the things he could do, right? And so um, he's, a, he's a legend in, in the company because no one has ever met him. I'm the only person, and I've actually never oh. met him. I've spoken to him. And like he wouldn't turn on his camera and he just hated people, but he got paid and he did the work reasonably well for an intern. So I was like very pleased with what I was able to find. And he's kind of been the blueprint for how we hire people as well in the company, which is we look for people that have a little bit of odd quirkiness, but they kind of balance that out with also mm. being really good at something. And the reason that people don't want to hire them is because they're really odd. I wouldn't say everyone in my team is like that, but there's a little bit of that oddness that <laughs> okay. comes out. And which is good. I mean, it's good. Like we call them, we, we call them diamonds in the rough. Other people would call them, you know, they didn't make the pile, so <laughs> they didn't make the inbox. Um, but uh, I mean, okay, I want I want to kind of come back to what you were saying as well, because when you're talking about, you know, the the difference in styles of how we work in house and how we work in agency, right? Because I I think that my misconception before when I was working in agency before I went in house was that. In-house people relied too heavily on agencies, and agency people were kind of the cream of the crop. And I was—it was a misconception I had. And if I'm talking when I was in my early twenties, yeah. Then I went in-house and I saw, okay, there's a lot of times agencies do jack all, like literally they're they're just arms and legs that you hire slightly cheaper than full-time staff, right? And so I was like, okay, it balances out really well. 
what if you if you like to look at your time spent when you're working, you know, at, at Chirp, TripAdvisor, all those guys with Panda, right? What were some of the best lessons that you actually learned from like running those teams and like really, like you said, executing? Uh, these massive campaigns because they're very big campaigns. Okay, I I guess it boils. In fact, it, what I'm going to share is not very marketing related. It's actually a bit more op related. The best lessons are, I guess, people is the most. I mean, people to me they are they are really important, right? Because if there's no no great people, then yeah, it's very tough to do my work, of course. Uh, so uh, my learnings really is to get people with the right attitude, ideally the right skills believe in your values i think they are the people okay. that can help to grow the business i mean why i say ideally the right skills because for me i i'm not one who is very hard up on you know you need to have at least a marketing degree or even you need to have at least like i mean even uh, you need to have at least like x years of experience in marketing for a role as long as you have a great attitude you are willing to roll up your sleeves to get things done great um I and you believe in our values, right? I think you are, then you will be for me. I I think so far this approach has not failed me in my in in hiring my people. So I guess people management, of course, people management uh, is is one lesson that I've always been learning, still learning today. I think another one is also direction, right? Um, it, I mean, it, it, if you know, if you do not have a very clear direction on where the business is growing. You know, regardless of how stellar your team is, I mean, maybe you're great at hiring, right? Or, you know... I'm not. I'm not. I'm really please bad. don't be humble. I'm about to say that. <laughs> they, will, they will stick around for long. Uh, that's for sure. And I've seen it yeah. in, in the companies that I work for. I mean, uh, and in, 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 in even, you know, you're you able to like, you know, get, afford them or, you know, bump up their pay. As long as, you know, there's no direction because it cascades down. Direct, no direct, lack of direction, messy, frustration, um, and, and yeah, and so they won't stick around for long. So I guess having a clear direction is also important. Uh, I think the last bit is, you know, you need to have, to cl have clear communication and provide instant feedback. Uh, I, 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 I guess uh, being an Asian, Asian companies, or traditional Asian companies, okay, I shouldn't, I shouldn't generalize, sorry. You know, it's always, you know, you, you try to be nice. You know, you, you try to like, you know, okay, this person is not doing a good job, but let, let's give him, a, give him or her a second chance, right? You try to be nice about it. But I've always uh, referred to, I'm not sure whether you know of this author called Brene Brown. I mean, what she said about, you know, being clear yeah. is kind and being unclear is unkind. Uh, I think I, I relate a lot to it also because, you know, a lot of people, I guess, fall under the character category of being nice right but they may not be kind uh example you know example not providing instant feedback to somebody who you think not is not doing a very good job it's may, may be a nice thing to do but it's not a kind thing to do because ultimately that effect would would, would you know it, it, it would be bad right it, it, yeah i mean how you affect internally and and you're not trying to solve a problem and in the end you know result the, the impact the result wouldn't be would be great so yeah i i guess that is I always uh, refer to that lah, and and of course, I mean I'm all, I'm also reading the book Radical uh, Ra Radical Candor about you know saying what you think while also giving a damn about the people you're saying it to, right? Oh, we we follow that we follow that in the company. Radical Candor is a huge part of how we actually provide feedback in the company because ruinous empathy is the worst thing that you can do, and it's a Really, really bad trait in, and I'll follow as well with traditional <laughs> yes. Asian companies. It's a very bad trait that they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, so we, we follow. So Radical Candor is a big thing. Everyone that comes in the company, we have to do like a mini workshop on what Radical Candor is because no one knows. And then we're going to explain to them, you're going to hear some things that you think are going to be harsh, but they're not meant to be harsh. They're meant to give you honest feedback that's going to guide you in the yeah. right direction. And you get to do the same to us, even me, even mm. anyone else in the company. Regardless of whether we look upset or not, mm. you get to say that, right? And yeah. you can't hold it against you. So yeah, no, I, I, no, I see that. I, that's, that's actually a really interesting thing that you're looking at because yes. oddly enough, I think a lot of people forget that if you if you put in the effort to give, give people like the, the tools in yeah. order for them to succeed by, you know, it, it's not about individually like spending all spend six hours with your degree. It's more 
here, here's a platform, and here's a, here's a tool, here are tools for you to succeed. For the most part, most people are going to do really well. I think it's just that when, when people get too big or, or when you kind of lose sight of the goal, as you mentioned, having a clear yeah. goal, having a clear uh, story, and having a clear plan, you lose yeah. sight of a lot of these other things. And I couldn't agree with you more. That's, that's the, you're kind of mirroring a little bit of like what we, like the challenges we face, also like some of the lessons we learned when we were when we were starting up as well. It's the, maybe it's the same. Maybe everybody has the same. Yeah, issues maybe. We about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just, mm. what, one thing I love actually asking uh, experienced marketers such as yourself, especially, is marketing has changed so much. So if I look at PR and content, we've changed like. It has changed so much, but if you, I, I swear to you, and this always irritates a lot of people in my industry, if you go and talk to the old heads, so the people from like, you know, from far before, right, they will say that, oh, no, it's it's almost the same, like just a few media change here. No, it's completely changed. It's, it, people refuse to admit that PR is completely done, completely flipped, right? For you, in your experience, since you've been working in marketing for many years, like what have been what has been like the biggest leaps of the biggest changes you've seen? I know it's a very broad question, so feel free to like narrow that down. Just I have to say nothing point. because you know I can't reveal my age thing. <laughs> <laughs> in the last in the last three years that you've been in okay, the never mind. <laughs> I'm, Since uh, university, I mean it's been uh, twelve years, right? Ever since I graduated, uh, I guess there are two 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 bits of things that I really saw changed. The uh, huge so more so the, the huge emphasis on on uh, on offline previously offline marketing and now. Huge mm. emphasis in online, yeah. right? And and because you know, I remember when I just started out, started out, and my first job was in Faiz organization. It's a real private real estate company. In, 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 in oh Spain. wow! Okay, they yeah, were doing yeah. so well then. I I remember you know the ads, well, the marketing that they were doing were really like traditional marketing, right? Like print ad, straight times, full page, first page, you know, mm. and, and and this all cost a bomb, right? Out of home magazines right and they, these were all like very sought after marketing marketing uh collaterals right or, or even uh channels but but now i i i think i really think it has evolved uh i guess also accelerated evolved to you know digital marketing but accelerated uh, especially during covid right because market companies that you know previously mm -hmm. were like okay trying a little bit dabbling a little bit into digital marketing and then they were forced to, to dabble a lot into marketing uh, into digital marketing because of everyone was was forced to stay at home right so they had to, to to experiment with that but yeah um what i've been observing is also you know uh you know digital ads short form videos you know ugc content user generated content i promise i'm not that i'm not a I'm not biased because I, I came from TripAdvisor, but I really see that that shift uh, towards you know uh, UGC content. They they're already getting a lot of traction. Uh, also, very interestingly, and I guess also because of the the niche that I I, I am right now in terms of type marketing, right? Uh, they all they won't tell me like Acast. I want to provide. I want to give you X dollars and help me to do offline ads. Help me to do out of home. No, they will be like Cast. I give you X, X dollars. Can you help me to come up with a plan for digital buy? I, so far, I haven't really come across any. And of course, maybe, I mean, I, I should talk to more clients, a bigger ones probably. But so far, I really haven't come across any that like, hey, I give you, I have a lot of budget for offline. Can you please uh, provide me with a, a, a proposal? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I, no, you're, you're yeah. right. You're right, yeah. I, 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 saw, I saw there's a... Someone told me this, and I'm, like, I'm trying to remember who it is, so I'm struggling with the name. Uh, but basically, what they said was offline... Well, offline is still doing okay, but it is now the, the the purchases for offline are very specific to companies that are looking to uh, are looking to hit either very specific stakeholders, you know, drivers, uh, slightly older folks, or really targeted offline, you know, people who literally put it on like mailboxes and stuff like that. So really, really specific, or companies that are looking to are looking to use that as as mm. a brand awareness tool to complement yeah. their digital marketing. So they do really targeted, they do really targeted uh, geo, geo map stuff and then they start they pump uh, banner ads around there and like there's, yeah. there's a billboard and everything. And it, apparently it really works. And But 
yes, only bigger, bigger brands can do that because it's really, really cost. It's it's cost restricted, but it's it's also so oddly enough, it's also like a, I, what I saw a lot of companies that technically I wouldn't even think want to do it because they're fully digital. They're doing it too. They're so you know like Grab did it really aggressively in Malaysia. I don't know if they did it in Singapore, but they did it very aggressively in mm. Malaysia and Indonesia as well, where they would just run really specific ad campaigns for certain areas and then pump billboards yeah. everywhere around there. It was, it was apparently I, I don't know for a fact, but I think it was I think but Grab also had the money right. Uh, to to pump ads everywhere yes, because yeah, offline yeah. is expensive. Yeah, I uh, so yeah. Yeah, they did. So they I think did, yeah, like, I think did. that's a bit the biggest change. No, I, uh, I, I guess. I mean, I do have another one. Um, I also do see a a, a lot of uh, brand marketing work transit into um not not really transit, but more last time there's a lot of focus on brand marketing. You know, uh, but now there's a lot of focus on growth performance marketing, right? Because previously. Uh, I think only big like FMCGs or even big organizations. So when you do brand marketing work, they they can only measure it uh based on you know the pre and post uh, brand campaign, uh, you know sentiment right to see whether hey you know uh, before before yeah. you do the brand marketing uh, before you brand branding work, what was the sentiment after what was it was an increase and these are only things that companies with budget can do. Um, so even if you are a small company and yeah. you do this kind of you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, brand uh, marketing work you it's very tough to measure uh especially if it's like you know offline stuff uh but now i think with a lot of uh, performance marketing growth marketing uh uh campaigns that pe- that you know marketers launch uh the feedback is almost instant right i can just you know put in x dollars in google ads or even facebook or ig or even tiktok for that matter and i can get the feedback immediately because i know okay what's your cost per click <laughs> what's your cost per acquisition Right, and I can immediately optimize. So I think that's also a another another uh, change in marketing ever since I started. Yeah, Br- brand 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 awareness and brand 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 marketing in general is technically I wouldn't say it's dying. I just think it's going through a pivot right now because okay, one of my one of my struggles has always been with with marketers and with comms people. So specifically brand, not performance, yeah. specifically on the brand side, right? It's always been that everyone tried to kind of stay away from the the terrible sales thing. Like, are we driving revenue? Are we are we a cost center or are yeah. we a revenue generator? Right. And PR PR is like the worst at this because everyone t- every time someone says like you know we need more sales and people like whoa, whoa 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 you know what we do and then they get run away from it. But my entire thing is if because what we sell is the fact that the more people know you, the more likely they're going to buy something. But we don't want to peg anything to that, so we don't want any of the risk, yeah. but we want all the reward, right? But what I what so what I started to do was, and and we measured this for a few clients, the ones that were nice enough to share us, uh, share with us some data, was that they were already running digital campaigns, paid ads, not really big ones, say mm. say about ten k a month, which is decent size for a small company, and then they were, they said, hey, can we do a PR campaign because we want to like reach out to investors and stuff. And when we were running the campaign, they mentioned that they were running paid advertisements. And I said, can I see your your uh, your cost of acquisition mm. pre and post? So let's look at six months before and let's look at the three to four months that mm. we run the PR campaign. Mm. What happened? And I think from month two, three, four, and then actually a month after we finished, we were seeing uh, as high as a 30% reduction mm. in cost of acquisition because brand awareness was going up. And... We actually got them back as a client. It was really cool. I wasn't even trying to sell them anything. I just really wanted to see the data. Uh, but they came back because they're like, wait, you saved us 30% in cost of acquisition. And then that, the first thing that happened. Then we started doing this more and more. The, I think the more realistic number is about 15, is about half of that. But if you run, if you're really good at digital ads and you're really good at uh, Google ads, like any some Google ads or anything like that, PR or brand marketing is really important because that will eventually that will be what will drive down cost of acquisition mm. more organically because you can optimize at some at some point optimization is yeah. going to hit a ceiling but then brand branding is actually going to help with reducing cost of uh, cost of uh, acquisition because I mean the Airbnb is kind of a, an amazing example even though I'm, I'm not a massive fan of mm. Airbnb it's just terrible terrible service uh, but. They they basically stop performance yeah. marketing for some bit, some time, and again they can do it because I mean it is it is Airbnb right it's different it's a different beast 
I don't think anyone else should stop performance marketing, but it was more of they showed the value of what branding and what uh, what uh, organic uh, organic leads. Yeah, and organic I, I, I think that's actually a very good measure. Cost of acquisition before and after PR, but your the only variable has to be PR. Then you are able to measure. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and so it's, it's a lot easier to measure with like small mm. companies, startups and, and people that they then stage of growth, but they also don't have, you know, two million yeah. to like burn, right? If they, if they have, if, because if you add, if they can spend this amount of dollars and they're like, okay, cool, it's money that I burned for branding. But then I said, hey, you actually saved $60,000 on, on acquisition or the, or the same period. Then they, yeah. so for them, it's a no-brainer. They're like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm making money and I'm getting these intangible benefits as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I see it. But uh, I, I might be in the minority here a little bit because I always, I always get into, I wouldn't say arguments, but there are disagreements that I've had with people in my industry particularly because no one wants to be pegged to anything that is immeasurable. Like really, no one really wants to be pegged to anything that's measurable. All right, uh, I won't take too much of your time, Kasia, because I think we actually had a really good discussion that's taking up a little bit more time, but maybe I can ask one last question. And this is really kind of the takeaway that I want people listening to. Like, do you have any growth tips and tricks for like, say tech companies, startups, people that are looking to grow? Yes, I would say, so I think I'll, I'll just probably provide uh, recommendations or like, you know, tips for, for early stage and growth stage startups. <laughs> I think for early stage, Companies tend to want to reserve cash. Um, don't spend money in brand marketing. Trust me, don't. Uh, leverage on your connections and network to drive brand awareness. Um, and I hope, and, and really with little or no ad spend. I know that's like going against what I'm trying to sell, right? Because technically, you know, I, I would want companies to, to, to invest in, 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 in marketing work or even ads uh, uh, in order half. But I think for the benefit of, you know, really early stage, really early stage company. Don't do that. Leverage on your connections. I think one, one, one thing that I did uh, when I was at uh, Food Panda was really, and mind you, the time uh, Food Panda was really, I think I was there and celebrated their two, second or third birthday. Still the orange branding. Uh, and we, I was trying mm -hmm. to leverage on the restaurants that we had. And again, food del association with food delivery with Food Panda is low. Everyone think, when they think about food delivery, they think about McDonald's. Burger King, Pizza Hut, Canadian Pizza. Really? That was the, the dinosaur era. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah, and, I get it, and uh, I get it. we just really wanted to tap on our on our restaurants, right? I mean, since we are really working with them, why not? Then and, and we managed to launch a you know a offline brand awareness campaign, putting stickers. It may be seem like a it may seem like a really a, a no-brainer, like right now, but at that point in time, very few companies apart from TripAdvisor uh, would, was doing it. Uh, so, so yes. Uh, after that, you know, of course, in, uh, we we also uh, work with you know we also do activate our own digital ad channels to to drive the usual growth lah. But what I also realized is there was also a peak in in uh, uh, delivery order count after we 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 launched that campaign. So I think on average, uh, fifteen to twenty five percent month on month growth. Uh, but of course, Food Panda then was under Rocket Internet Group, so we had. Quite a bit of money to spend, uh, but that being said, a lot of people also knew us, right? A, a lot of came to us and like, hey, um, I knew you through this particular restaurant. I saw you, you know, um, uh, and, and and that was where the leads came in. So this, I think, early stage really reserved cash. Uh, try to leverage, you know, on what you have, your network, drug brand awareness, whether or not it's like partnership, co-marketing partnerships. Just tap onto other people's or your your connections uh, network to drive growth. A okay. tip is mainly for growth uh, stage uh, startups. Um, I think by then you would have um, a decent user base. Uh, my recommendation is really to run internal campaigns, A B test and optimize, like constantly test, so that you know you can reiterate and optimize. I I I I. I I mean, I do have an example though. Um, on you know, because when I was at uh, Cho, uh, when I joined, it was, I think they, they were launching campaigns one once every a few months, and uh, I just wanted you know, doing marketing, you can either have quantity or you have quality. You go wide or you go deep, right? 
Um, and I just thought, okay, let's try with the quantity bit because, you know, at a point in time, we were still trying to figure it out uh, what worked and what didn't. And I think our breakthrough was um, having launched this uh, Korean drama inspired video that that garnered us uh, 1.2 million views in, in two months. And, and that was actually before TikTok <laughs> ever even came to the picture, you know. So, so yeah, and I think from that video, it was meant to be a funny uh, video. And I, I also remember very vividly that Hosan Leong, I mean, everyone knows that he's a comedian in Singapore, right? He commented and said it was funny. And so I was like, wow, that is really, I mean, that, that's a, that's a, that's a feed by itself, right? But anyway, because of that video, uh, we saw our ad uh, downloads also increase because the video kind of, uh, the CTA is to download the ad. So we saw the uh, app increase, uh, app download increase uh, by more than 25% month on month. And that's actually the four times the average. So, so yeah, just really keep trying, keep testing, keep optimizing. And, and one day that would be a breakthrough. <laughs> Okay, no, that's really interesting. I think that's really cool because it's always been it's always been difficult, at least for a lot of people, to kind of share tips that make sense or tips that are that they can relate to real experiences that they've had. Because I think a lot of people like to share these really short, sharp tips that, for the most part, don't make any sense. So I kind of appreciate when someone actually brings it yeah. into like a real example of how things work. Right, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, Cass, because I know that we've had technical issues as well, and you've been extremely patient with me. So why don't you tell? Why don't you tell people uh, how can you can head over choice? to? I mean, if if you know what I mentioned today is of any interest, um, and you would like to have a conversation with me, you can ho- head over to www. otterhalf, o t t e r h a l f. dot co, and and you 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 can actually book a a, a chat with with myself. Yeah. <laughs> awesome yes thank you so much all right okay th- thanks for the thanks for uh listening in everybody so if you want to uh hear and see more great content from us do visit all our uh, channels on uh social media uh, you can find us on youtube at cnpr you can find us on facebook instagram and linkedin we're not on tiktok that's tough but we will eventually be there one day all right thanks everybody <laughs>